everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. I'll be hanging out with you today as we finish up our series on genetic technology. Final topic we got to talk about today is genome evolution, which actually doesn't even relate to genetic technology. Maybe I should have stuck this in the evolution series, but well, here it is. So here's your objective for the day. There is just one of them, so forgive the typo that says objectives. By the end of the video, be able to describe multiple mechanisms through which the genome of an organism may evolve. So essentially what we're going to be talking about today is ways that genetic material picks up extra material that can be used as the raw material for evolution. So just going to go ahead and jump right in today. The first way that we can get extra material for evolution is through the duplication of sets of genetic material. Now, if you have got one set of genetic material. You got hap you are haploid. If you got two sets, you are diploid. Normal functioning human bodies have got most of the cells being diploid with sex cells being haploid. Now, there are some rare occasions where a gamete, a sperm or an egg, will pick up an extra set of genetic material. So instead of being haploid like usual, that sperm or egg is indeed diploid. Once that fuses up with the sperm or egg from the mate, you could end up with a triploid or tetraploid situation. Now, obviously, and I'm going to say this is a blanket statement for the rest of the video, most mutations are detrimental. They have some sort of deleterious effect on the organism with the mutation, which means that that organism is not likely to survive, which means the mutation is not likely to be passed along. Some mutations are silent, which means they just kind of hang out in the genetic material. They're passed along, but they don't cause any benefit or harm to the organism. Very rarely, but occasionally, there are beneficial mutations. Um, when it comes to poly polyploidy, there are a lot of plants that are tetraploid. So this is a very common situation in the plant kingdom. There's also like a rodent and a frog that have got tetraploid situations. So it's not completely unheard of. But the reason that this could be or could allow for uh, evolution to occur is think about it this way. If you get a duplication of chromosomes, you could have one set of the chromosomes functioning normally, providing everything that's needed for that organism to function. The other set could be collecting mutations without having any problems occur in the organism because the normal genes are still being expressed. That other set, as it collects mutations, it might occasionally pick up a beneficial mutation which would change the phenotype of the organism, allowing some sort of benefit in that organism. So by duplicating the genetic material, you allow for the possibility, you give more genes essentially for mutation and evolution to work on. Another way that you can increase the amount of genetic material or change the amount of genetic material is through the fusion of chromosomes. It says down there at the bottom of mice and chimps. There has been some analysis work done on our genetic material compared to the genetic material of other mammals, and there's been a couple interesting things that have been found. Chimps have actually got 24 chromosomes, so their diploid number is 48. Ours is 26. So Researcher, researchers started doing some analysis and they found that our chromosome number two is very similar to two chromosomes that exist inside of a chimp. As they compared the sequences of those chromosomes, they found that it is very, very likely that at some point in time those two shorter chimp chromosomes fuse together into the longer human chromosome number two. Um, doing other comparisons, they found that there's another chromosome in humans and forgive me at the moment, I don't remember what number it is, but it looks like that chromosome is the fusion of four chromosomes that are found in mice. So as they took the mice chromosomes and the human chromosome and laid them side by side, stained them, looked at banding patterns, it looked like at some point four chromosomes present in the mouse had fused together to fuse to form one of the chromosomes that is in humans. So that would be another way that genetic material can be changed around allowing for some sort of evolutionary benefit. And then, of course, there's duplication and inversion. Essentially speaking, having extra genetic material isn't always a good thing, but it does allow for that possibility of mutations that could be beneficial. So if you duplicate a gene, that means that it's possible you're going to get more of whatever protein that gene codes for made. If you've got more of that protein, that could provide some sort of benefit for the animal. And I don't know this to be the case. It's just something I'm thinking of in my head. But... If I were to think of the genetic material that codes for hemoglobin in our red blood cells, if that gene got duplicated and we got extra hemoglobin, that would mean that we would have the ability to carry more oxygen, which seems like it'd be beneficial to me. Now, I'm not saying that actually happens. Who knows? It might. 
but I'm just thinking of it as a hypothetical. So in some cases, the production or the overproduction of a protein might confer some benefit. And then obviously, if that confers benefit on the organism, the organism will reproduce more, which means that that mutation is going to get passed on to subsequent generations. Come on. There we go. All right. So a lot of this mutation, duplication, inversion, all that, depends upon transposable elements. A transposable element is a part of a gene or part of genetic material that can be moved to somewhere else. Now, there's a lot of different ways these can work, but essentially what happens is that transposable element, element during the process of crossing over could allow for unequal crossover. So let's say it takes a piece of one chromosome along with it when it moves. <clears throat> transposable just means to move. It takes a piece of a chromosome, sticks it onto another chromosome, you've now got an unequal crossover where one chromosome lost genetic material and another one got extra. That one on the right hand side, you see there is a gene for transposon en enzyme, transposable element. That gets pulled out and it gets stuck right in the middle of a gene, so that gene gets disrupted. Probably usually a bad situation, but who knows, it could have a I don't know, I guess evolutionary benefit. So know that a transposable element is a piece of genetic material that gets moved from one place to another place. All right, introns and exons, and we are almost done for the day. We've talked about introns and exons. You see a beautiful diagram there. You've got your DNA on the top, and going down that DNA, you see exon, intron, exon, intron. We've talked about how exons are the pieces that actually code for the production of protein. Introns have other functions within the body. That DNA is going to be changed to or uh, transcribed to mRNA, which will then be eventually read to produce a protein. And we've talked about how sometimes um, alternative splicing can occur where different introns are cut out or left in or they're cut at different places providing different variations on the same gene. Another situation you could get is maybe an exon could be duplicated, in which case you might have a portion of a protein that gets overproduced. Let's say you get an extra set of amino acids that is a duplication that could provide some sort of benefit to that protein or make increase its function or lower its function, whatever the case may be. But by duplicating or shuffling the order of that those exons, you're going to either add more amino acids or change the order of your amino acids, which could again change the function of the protein, possibly conferring some sort of benefit on the organism. Final thing I want to talk about is in a lot of ways, and there are a lot of ways of doing this, um, the genetics of multiple organisms can be compared. And there's a whole branch of scientists or science that works on this. And there's a lot of ways that they compare. You can compare the banding pattern. So if you stain genetic material, different parts of the chromosomes stain in different ways. You can use that to compare the chromosomes between different animals. Um, that's probably one of the ways they found out about the two chimp chromosomes that had fused to form a human chromosome number two. You can lay straight up base sequences side by side. Things that we can find out is if, um, wait, let me back up on that. This type of comparison, one of the things it can be used for is to figure out how long it's been since two animals diverged from one another, meaning that somewhere evolutionarily they split and had a last common ancestor and started going their separate ways. Obviously, the more bases or genes or genetic material they have in common, the more related they are. The fewer genes or bases that they have in common, the less related that they are. Now, if you dig back in the DNA, as you go back through, you'll find that there are common elements that go all the way back to even the most primitive uh, organisms. We talked about Hox genes or homeobox genes that set up body patterns for multiple organisms. The same gene in a fly that shows or tells the developing embryo where the head should be probably do the same thing in a human. So that would be one example of a comparison showing some probable evolutionary relationship because that gene has been conserved. Um, Comparisons can also be used to show how long it's been since two organisms diverged because uh, genetic material picks up mutations at a fairly predictable rate. So scientists can look at how many mutations are different or how much genetic material is different between two organisms and make some guesses or estimates about how long it's been since those two organisms last had a common ancestor. So all that stuff to say that Usually mutations are bad, but occasionally they do provide some evolutionary benefit, which will then be passed on through generation after generation after generation. I hope that this long, slightly rambling tutorial has been beneficial to you. I'm Mr. Kite. This is a Lab 207 webcast. Hopefully we'll see you again. Thank you.